Stoller, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a truly an honor to have you on. Uh, how are you, first and foremost? I'm fine. I hope you are well as well. We're doing very well. I'm very excited, Kieran, for this yes. episode. Uh, we have a lot of questions to ask, so I guess we'll just crack on. I guess I want to start where it all started for you. Um, you first got promoted with Hamkam as a player. You then went on to uh, secure their best ever league position. Then you go move on to Lillestrøm. We'll get back into that. Then you come back as a manager, get promoted with them again, also get fifth league position. Then earlier this year, you were a uh, temporary, a three-day fix, so to speak, coaching them. You've had your son, who's played there now. He plays for Stavik. Um, you've been an investor at the time. You have your wife within the board there. What is it that makes you and this club such a, a good match? No, I think that uh, it's based on uh, that um, when I was uh, after the military, when I was about 20, I moved to Hamar uh, to start my education. There was not full-time professional uh, at that time. You were half-time professional. That means you also needed an education. So I started uh, taking the teaching school, uh, high school for teachers. Um, and uh, I went there for three years and, um, and studied for three years to become a teacher. And uh, during that time, I started playing for Hamkam, who was uh, in the second division or the next highest division then. I had some offers from other clubs, but... Uh, you couldn't live uh, on. Uh, I wasn't sure that was able to live uh, on football the rest of my life, so I had to have an education, and uh, that's why I, uh, yes, I lived there for five years, played five seasons, and uh, naturally got uh, some friends, and uh, and um, yeah, felt connected to the area, and uh, it's been more or less our base now. We have still a house there, which. Uh, all family members sometimes uh, come together or one or one. So, um, so um, yeah, that's the background. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Stala, before we, we've got a lot of questions on your playing career, but we feel like we have to ask about your experience with the legend that is Jan Age Fjortov, <laughs> who's obviously this young man's father. Um, and you played, you had some experience playing with him for the Norwegian national team. Can you share a little bit about what he was like as a teammate? And does it have to be good? Uh, <laughs> <be honest>, uh, <laughs> no, first of first first of all, he was uh, what you can call a. Um, there are players that can play in several positions. He could only play in one, and that was uh, <laughs> that was a striker. He was uh, upset with goals, and I think uh, that's maybe some. Uh, players today lack that uh, quality. He he, uh, he counted goals. That was what uh, he uh, was living for. Uh, he um, he had a great understanding of the game, and I think that his his uh, his uh, best thing as a footballer was how to sniff goals. He he knew when to start. He knew when to finish. He could finish in different ways. Uh, uh, and he could cover the ball well. Uh, you could always play up to him and you could keep the ball and he could play it uh, back to you in midfield and then occupy a new position. But foremost of all, he, he was a goal scorer and that was what he wanted to be. And, um, and uh, I don't think that he never... He, I don't think he tried to hide that. Uh, and you can also see that with his celebrations, he, he wanted to score goals. And uh, I think also he was uh, selfish in terms in a good way, because I think that when you put 11 players on the pitch, we have different roles. His role was to, to score goals and his role was to, um, to in difficult periods, uh, keep the ball up for us. But I, I think that uh, every player who has played with him would say more or less uh, uh, what he was best at was uh, sniffing the goals and and be calm in in uh, situations in and around the penalty area. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you a funny story. I, I, he will probably regret it. In, uh, he will probably <laughs> deny it himself. But uh, uh, my tenth national game was a really big game against the, the Czechs at home. If we won that in 1995, we would qualify for Euro 1996 in England. 
And um, I was playing from the beginning. I wasn't used to that because uh, Kjetil Rektal was the owner of that position. But uh, in those in that uh, days, in those months, I was having that position. And uh, so on the tactical meeting, there was a um, big ask who going to take the penalties. Henning Berg, who was um, Blackburn United, you all know him. He said that Ståle takes them. He takes them for Lillestrøm so he can take it. And Drillo, the legendary coach, says, Ståle, you take them. No problem, I say. And then we get to the warm-up. And then we stretch a little bit. And then Jan Åge comes up to me and say that uh, you take the penalty, Ståle. But if, it, but if it's 2-0 or more, I will take them. <laughs> 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 and I think that <laughs> sums up a little bit his uh, eagerness to score goals then yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. but uh, uh, Jan Hage is uh, uh, I think that he was a little bit underrated for some of his seasons abroad uh, and that he also had the mental toughness to um, to um, to live in good in, in both English uh, clubs and in German clubs and obviously was a big star in Rapid Wien and um, so I think that his career is maybe a little bit um, underestimated in, from, in terms of that. I'm sure that you'll appreciate um, appreciate those kind words and also the thing with the penalty. I think it's a, it does sum him up because it's a fair compromise because <laughs> he'll be the first to acknowledge he was not good at penalties um, but to narrow up that sounds fair. Uh, <laughs> And I might not have inherited his goal scoring abilities, no, but I can, I but I can that. only sc- be in one position, just like him. I'll be yeah. in the defense. <laughs> but on the topic of the goal scoring abilities, you yourself. So I, obviously, I know much of you. But when we do, you do a deeper dive into your career, and you look into the into your goals or games to goals ratio. It's about a goal every three to three and a half games for yourself. And you know, at times you might have played. Striker, but primarily your your position was as a midfielder, and being a goal scoring midfielder seems like there is less of a case. Maybe that's to do with the evolution of the game, but it's it's less so the case now than it, than it was before. What what do you think made you such a such a goal threat from from midfield? Uh, I think when I played in Scandinavia and played in Hamkam and Lillestrøm, uh, I was uh, playing as a box-to-box midfielder, and uh, and then I could read the game quite well, and I, I was decent in the air and was decent in timing my runs into the penalty area, and I also scored my all my nine or eight nine international goals when I had a little bit role. Like I could be have a little bit more um, freedom to roam forward, but uh, in all board and also some games in the national team, uh, I was more a defensive midfielder. Uh, and then obviously you are not uh, scoring that many goals. But in Hamkam and Lillestrøm, I think it's right. I have a goal rate to every third game or something. Um, uh, but um, to do that internationally, you need to be a better player than I was. I was a very, very good uh, in, uh, national player in Norway and Denmark. Maybe for a couple of seasons in Denmark, maybe for a couple of seasons in Norway, I was uh, the best player in the league. But internationally, I was uh, quite average. And then I needed to um, to make sure that... Um, that uh, I could cope with the tempo uh, because usually I came from the Scandinavian league to play in the national team. Uh, so I was okay uh, internationally because I could play in different roles. Uh, I could run uh, if Ivan Leonardson wasn't there, I could run for him. If Mikulan has been uh, on the town, I could play be a little bit playmaker. And if Rektal uh, wasn't moving that well, I could play in, in for him in a defensive role. Uh, but if everyone was fit, I think that uh, I uh, would, uh, they would have been in front of me because they had. Uh, I was an all-round player. They had uh, certain extreme qualities. So uh, internationally, uh, I didn't score so many goals, and that was due to that I was not uh, good enough. Well, fifty-eight, I believe, national caps for Norway during the greatest time for Norwegian football. I wouldn't say is that average. So I'll give you a bit more credit <laughs> than you give yourself. But on that topic, then you say you played domestically, you played for Lillestrøm. Yes, you, you were awarded midfielder of the year um, in 95, I believe. Um, and then you go to, to Wimbledon. 
who at the time is in the Premier League. They, they, when they went down, they'd been in the Premier League consecutively for 14 years. I look at it and I see you play six games. It says you get two men in the match. You score a goal against West Ham and then it stops. Why did it end so so briefly? Because by the by the looks <laughs> of it, it looked like a pretty good start. Yeah, two words joking there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Fair he, uh, he, he was the manager. We couldn't see eye to eye, so yeah. Uh, and I should probably also keep my mouth shut. But uh, I <laughs> agree with absolutely everything he did uh, on and off the pitch, and it was a disaster for me. So I couldn't get away. Um, and actually, the few games I played, it went decent, but I was. Uh, uh, desperate to get away from him, and uh, I think he was desperate to get rid of me. So, uh, so um, it, it was half a year in London, um, good experience, but uh, uh, it was not. It was it was not meant to be with me, him and me. So, um, so um, yeah, that's that's it's it's like that. That's how it is sometimes, isn't it? How did you find that transition to English football? Because you obviously experienced it as a player there going to Wimbledon, but then 15 years later, you experienced it as a manager when, when you went to Wolves. And I'm wondering how those two experiences compared and if you maybe learned a lot from the first time. Uh, not really, because I think it was very special with Wimbledon at that time and things then move on. And obviously my manager time and Walt Rampton was my less, uh, was my uh, uh, was not a I was not very successful. I think that was a little bit down to the circumstances that they had. They went down uh, from the Premier League with twenty five points, and uh, we should build a new team. So we lost uh, Fletcher to um, Sunderland. We lost Jarvis to uh, West Ham, and we lost Kitely to Sco- Stoke. They they had. 70% of the goals and assists from the year before where they have only taken 25 points and and I'd made mistakes there because we should build a new new team and um, and with um, obviously we got I think we got 25 million pounds for those players and then we should be able to use eight nine ten of them to build a new team but you couldn't get much quality in English football at that time because the transfer fee was so high also in the in the championship not like today where there are not so many uh, high transfers in the championship but at that time they were very high so it was impossible to get quality for eight nine ten million um, pounds so we went abroad uh, and we bought five players, and if I'm really hard on myself, one was successful, one, half was okay, but three was a big failure. And that means that the team was uh, an average championship team, and that was exactly what we was, but we were expected to go straight up again. So uh, when I left, I think we were 17th or 18th or something, uh, but it only got worse because they, they went down. And I think that the whole town was a little bit in depression mood after three years in the Premier League. And uh, and the, the championship at that time was brutal, more yeah. much more brutal than today. So I, I, unfortunately, uh, it didn't uh, work out. So I, and I think that what I did wrong was the was the the the, the transfers. Uh, they were not very successful, except for one. And the, I remember you, you quoted saying that the reason you were fired was the same reason you were appointed, meaning that they wanted you to take you into the the club into yeah. a modern direction. Um, yeah. And then when you left, they said, "Okay, we're going back to the roots." Yeah. It kind of. Yeah sums football up a bit doesn't it in terms of yeah the but, but that was I, I that was down to the owner it was steve morgan it was a as was a very wealthy man he tried to buy liverpool was close to buy by liverpool once upon a time and uh, and obviously he wanted a new direction and when he didn't see results um and and when i got sacked he either had to backed me in two more transfer windows, the January window and the summer window, or we had to get rid of me. And then it was probably much, much cheaper to get rid of me and see if those players could um, then go back to their roots, uh, how they had played more under Mick McCarthy. And uh, and then they 
they took a traditional British manager uh, and see if uh, that could go, but um, it, it didn't work out that either. No. Did you feel like you were the right man, but at the wrong time in some ways? In Volgramp, I must say also I had to blame uh, myself because you need to be, uh, you need to, uh, you need to make sure that the transfers are more uh, accurate than that was. So uh, I think everyone would have struggled there in in terms so um, that it, it was depression within the whole town, in the whole club, because uh, you know when you go down, also uh, the players had to cut their wages 50%. That is not uh, also healthy for uh, the atmosphere in the dressing room. Everyone wants want to join another Premier League club or, or go back to the Premier League. But, but that was not the case um, they, because they probably some of them were not also good enough. Yeah. If we get back to your playing career, Stolly, after following Wimbledon, you then make the decision to go to Denmark where you finish your career there and then you've obviously managed spent a lot of time there managing there in the past um, and it's to the point where you can maybe even say it's a second home but back then initially why why did you choose to go to Denmark? Uh, at that time there was no transfer windows uh, and uh, this was happening in March and there was not uh, and suddenly um, this club Alborg came up I didn't know anything about them but they they um, uh, this was three months before the World Cup and I played all the qualification games. I was actually a top scorer in the World Cup qualification to 1998. Made four goals and Solskjaer and Flo and those were on three goals. So that's maybe my biggest achievement as a player. Huh? <laughs> but um, then uh, Drillo, who was the coach, called me and said, now you have to play to make sure that you secure your place in the summer. And then this all work came up and... Um, and um, I, I thought I was quite desperate. I didn't know much about them, but I knew that their coach was Hans Backe, who had been in, uh, coached in Starbeck uh, in Norway, and I knew him a little bit from that. So he, so I just took a chance, and um, I think that uh, the first eighteen months in Aalborg was maybe the eighteen months I played my best football. Um, sometimes you play a little bit better than you actually are. And I did that for 18 months. Uh, um, I, I think that I had a big hunger for revenge after Wimbledon, a big hunger to win something. Uh, I hadn't won anything as a club uh, player. And Aalborg was maybe the fourth, fifth biggest club in Denmark, still is, but there, there are others that were favorites. But suddenly we managed to pull um, a team together and uh, we won the championship in my first whole year there. And I think that uh, made the foundations for what was to come uh, also as a coach in, in, uh, in Denmark because I got um, uh, a good reputation. And, and you know, sometimes you, you maybe play better than you are. And that was the case for the first 18 months. I was not a great free kick shooter but suddenly the, that year I bent some balls over the wall and uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I did things that I, I, I didn't really nat nat naturally did so um, in all but I think they remember me um, <laughs> better than I actually have. <laughs> That's not bad though but over 18 months then it must be some sort of yeah. quality speaking isn't yeah. it? it? must be and I'd be remiss to ask because obviously I want to get into your, your coaching career. And the reason I asked this question is because I wonder if, if there was some sort of revelation coming in, but obviously you had to, you had to end your, your, your playing career due to cardiac arrest and you were pronounced dead for seven minutes. And we had Uwe, Uwe Rössler on the last episode. And so yeah. there's a link there. And we asked him the same question in terms of how an incident like that changes your outlook on life is it is there a matter of remembering life before and after that incident and whether some things become more clear to you after you then were forced to retire in the case of maybe going to management or prioritizing other stuff i think that uh, obviously uh, you change some of your thoughts about life when something like that happened but um, I think that I was 33 at the time, so I was um, have maybe one, two, three uh, more years left uh, in my playing career. Mm -hmm. And you, 
suddenly you're standing there and you don't know what to do. And then I start taking coaching um, uh, studies, lessons, and uh, I uh, got um, uh, a big favor or a big ask from the Federation to, to, to train the under-18 uh, national team for Norway. And then I started to maybe feel that I will, that this is actually something you may enjoy. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, that sudden that the football suddenly was taken away from you um, and that the hunger for more, the hunger for competition was there uh, and you didn't get the, the choice to, to stop yourself. Maybe that uh, gave me some start for, for the coaching career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stolly, for a foreign audience, you know, people in the UK or even some American listeners who maybe know a little bit less about your coaching philosophy than those in, in Norway or Denmark, what influences helped shape your principles that define your, your management and your leadership approach today? Uh, I think that uh, every one of us who played in the 90s in Norway was uh, was uh, and who played in the Norwegian national team with Egil uh, Drill Olsen will always take some of his thoughts with us and some of his leadership with us. I think that um, uh, if you if you um, uh, go to the actually football philosophy, I think that um, the zone principles are very important for me that uh, I have a clear idea that it's better that 10 outfield players think uh, uh, at the same time and you are not concerned about the opposition man, you are more concerned about where the ball uh, where the ball is and where your teammates are. And if you move together there with the right distances, you should be able to cope better than in a man-to-man where you, if one is beaten, it's suddenly a big space is occur on the pitch. So I think that is defensively um, um, very important for me. Uh, and uh, that goes for all players. So everyone has to follow that. With In the offense, uh, I like to move the ball quick forward if it's possible. Uh, I like to play in the length of the pitch if possible. But you are, but you all also has to learn to read the game. Um, you need sometimes to rest with the ball, uh, to, to, um, um, to defend with the ball and rest with it. And you sometimes need to take the, um, the air a little bit out of the game. And then you have to be good on the ball. And I think we learned a lot of that in all the European games with FC Copenhagen against the better teams that you need to be able to use the ball, uh, not just for attacking, but also sometimes to rest with it uh, to be to to prepare so you can have more power in your counter attack so you have more power in your defensive work so you have more power in your one against one situations uh, both ways and to um, uh, to uh, feel that you really are into this game and uh, but when the op- when the when the opposition are out of position are, are not in balance obviously i want to attack fast mm-hmm. And arguably one of the one of the clubs or FC Copenhagen's in this case better games and sort of a, a manifestation of what you say is the one one game at home to Barcelona where <laughs> you know for all your might as a as a big Danish club you're up against probably one of the best ever sides to have played manage a one 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 draw um, in what is then a, a zonal defense structure what. What did you learn from a game like that? Or more so, what was your approach going into that game? What did you learn from it? And what do you think Barcelona and Guardiola learned from a game like that? Uh, first of all, we played uh, Barcelona in game three and four in the Champions League. So we lost 2-0 in the first game in, in Camp Nou. But uh, the second half was very even. And we were. it was only 1-0 just before... Uh, uh, the end of the game, but we put on another uh, uh, center back to move him, like you, Marcus, up in uh, the front line to get a <laughs> header and to get right. a knockdown or something. Uh, but uh, then they scored on the counter to 2 0. And uh, but we learned that uh, we needed to have even closer spaces between the lines, that the space would be even less, um, um, that 
We needed to be even more compact. We needed to be even better with the ball. We needed to have the ability to counter fast, but we also have to the ability to use the ball when we had it. And uh, I think that uh, the one-one in Parken, then everything for us. We probably were a little bit lucky, but still we played against Messi, seven eight. Uh, World Cup winners from Spain and Alves from Brazil, so it was maybe the best club team in the history. Uh, and I think every everything went right for us in a way that we got everything out. And I think what Guardiola, if there's something he learned from that game, is that when you play against a team like us there, uh, when we uh, stay quite high on them, we 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 uh, close um, uh, the the space between our midfield and defense so well that. I think what he learned is that you need to have someone who go deep. You need to have some players who like to go deep. And I, I think that uh, that's what also he said to us when we met him in uh, in Cologne some years later. Um, that um, that Sanchez, for instance, Alexis Sanchez, who came later, that you need a player to stretch the other team when you have a team that is so compact against. So... Um, so we can always uh, live high on that sentence. sentence <laughs> As you should Adiola. do. <laughs> As you should do. Absolutely. <laughs> Is it, and just before I let you yeah, yeah. answer a couple, because um, you had after the game, there was a little spat <clears throat> between you and, and, and Guardiola because of the previous game where the goalkeeper had whistled. I know you told this story before, but I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you in terms of retelling the story of you meeting him or Guardiola and his assistant, I believe, in Cologne later on, in which, you know, the guy is an absolute, like, obsessive f- football nerd and speaks to with you about football for the next three and a half, four hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a little bit of dispute there because in the first game, Cesar Santin was alone with the goalie and then the, their uh, Pinto, their second goalkeeper, whistled. And so Santin alone at Camp Nou before 80,000, 90,000 and 10,000 Danish uh, spectators he stopped and then uh, Pinto laughed on the bench together with some players. And I said, I remember it well, a, hopeless. Yeah, I said, there's a rotten egg in the basket or something <laughs> I said in the, in the press conference. And Guardiola was mad at me because of that. So, and stood before the game in Parken that, um, that he was um, not happy with my comment. And then uh, after the game, uh, we started to discuss that um, and obviously I was very happy with the 1-1 one, one. I don't think he was that happy and then it was some um, insults that lead to um, yeah that uh, Busquets sorted it out so there was no boxing game between us but <laughs> um, uh, then uh, two or three years later or two years later we um, I was coaching Cologne and he played the Champions League game in Leverkusen which is the neighbor of Cologne and we asked through his uh, assistant or um, or secretary if uh, we could have a meeting with him. And we were able to get that. So we sat in the reception when he came in and he um, he invited us, me and Bård Wiggen, who was my assistant, up to a bar where we uh, where we could sit in peace. And we had a tactical board with us and, uh, and we asked him questions. And, uh, and I could feel already then that maybe... He was on his way to Germany. I was actually very interested in the German culture and how that was in in football in Germany. Uh, And uh, he was obsessed. And uh, I think it was great for us. Two nobodies from Norway was able to sit down with him and and he spoke football for three and a half hours. And it was actually me who said that, um, thank you. (laughs) And then I think it was 3.30 at night or something. So... He, um, he he uh, gave us he gave everything also for us and we were yeah it was so much to uh, so interesting to listen to. Pim Society can paint on anything you want. Pim Society is a creative outlet for both you as a customer and then me as a creator. Now you can currently go on the website, fill in a form, and then you'll get. Um, will communicate through email. Yeah, Brilliant. That's incredible. Stolly, if we then go a bit deeper into your management career at Copenhagen, you've obviously had two spells there as manager and both have proved, you know, with remarkable success where you've won a total of eight Danish Super League of Championships, you've won Cups and a Royal League Cup. 
You also qualified for the last 16 in the Champions League, being the first Danish side to do so. And I'm wondering when you look back, what were some of the key reasons for the success at Copenhagen? And because I know although they're, you know, probably the biggest club in Denmark, that, you know, it's not easy to win football matches and it's even harder to win titles. And, you know, you can't take that for granted. And so I'm wondering what goes behind that and the process of kind of installing that winning habit. I think that we were um, good to install a, a great culture on in the in the <clears> club <throat> and off the pitch. I think everyone sp- spoke about the FCK DNA that you have a certain arrogance on and off the pitch, and I think that uh, uh, we were able to to use our zonal defense in a very very good way. That everyone understood that, and we were also good uh, for uh, on the transfer market. Um, it's not easy when you sell all your players after. W- after 18 months, two years, two and a half years, all your best players leave for bigger leagues and you have to always try to uh, have another player in the pipeline, maybe in your own uh, youth or in your own, um, in your own um, uh, group of players. But you also have to buy the right players. And, some, and I think that we were very successful with that. Obviously, you make mistakes, but overall, in a long period of time, we... We were able to um, to repeat our success, but but I think that it came harder and harder in terms of that we needed to sell more and more players, sell them um, more expensive than ever, uh, and then it's also difficult for us to to um, to get the right players in uh, to implement them straight into our tactics uh, because the. Uh, the Belgium League, the Dutch League, the Swiss League, they they suddenly had more money than us due to television, uh, not suddenly, but gradually, due to television deals, etc. Uh, so, but we, we managed to, to be around number 40 uh, in terms of um, in terms of position in, uh, in Europe, in the ranking. Uh, and I think that what made us uh, uh, made players choose us instead of big clubs in Germany, Netherlands, etc. Was that we were able to give them a career plan? Here, you come here, you develop, you win trophies. So we have that on your CV, and you will be able to go in two years' time, for instance. Uh, then we will not stand in the way for you, and you can then take the step to a bigger league. And and I think that many agents, many players. And as the rumors got that they trusted us, uh, we were able to uh, to win some fights against Belgium, uh, Dutch, uh, and maybe also a second Bundesliga, Austrian, Swiss mm-hmm. leagues, etc. Yeah, it seems very similar to Celtic's approach here in Scotland. Yeah. Um, Kira massive Celtic fan. So <laughs> yeah. actually, what he wants to ask you is why is Celtic the best uh, Celtic Park the best stadium we've ever been at? That's actually what he wants to ask, yeah. ask you. Yeah, a mixed experience there. I, I played the. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I think I played. Uh, I played uh, Celtic four times, two wins, one draw, and one loss. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, uh, first time in Celtic Park was Champions League. I think that was uh, then we lost one nil. Was tremendous yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. The same when we won 3-1 for a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember, I actually remember that game at Celtic Park. That was, a, I would have been eight or nine years old, 2006. Um, yeah. And it was kind of the first time I was going to the Champions League as a kid and we were in the group with Copenhagen and Benfica and Man U and we managed to qualify and I was lucky yeah. enough to go to all the home games and yeah, brilliant. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. No, fair play. He says to take me to a European night at Celtic Park, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> if Solly in any profession um, you always look towards the best and see what they do and see how much you can learn for, uh, from them and so for yourself being a football manager when you look to the, the world class managers are there any qualities that you see that they consistently inhabit I think that uh, when when you have the you have the probably uh, three of the best managers in in the in Europe or in the world now in in the top three in in England with 
Klopp, Guardiola and, and Tuchel, where every you can, and I think that what stands out is their um, is their will, their um, their uh, personality, and um, that um, they have the mentality and the power to keep going over longer periods and and uh, keep uh, trusting their ideas and and are also able to to um, develop. Uh, their systems, the players, etc. Uh, but I think it's 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 I think it's a lot about their personality that they are able to do that. Uh, so uh, as uh, everyone who is interested in football coaching, you you look at the best, and uh, and they have uh, different um, uh, to- tools. But uh, but you can see that. They are very driven, and they have a personality that uh, that um, that you can feel through the through the television when you watch them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Stola, for me, you strike me as that sort of persona in terms of you have your principles. You've stayed firm in your your ideas, ideas and principles that have led to you going down as the greatest coach for Copenhagen. Your the silverware and trophy record speaks for itself. You've built that up through your <laughs> will and sorts and personality. At the same time, you were at, and I'll, we'll mention this briefly, but you were at Cologne where my impression and from reading about you, they wanted maybe more so of a, a yes man, uh, more so in which something that you would accept in, in a lesser degree. How have you found negotiating that between you know, staying firm, but also going into a, in a different country and in culture, because you want to obviously imprint your mm. ideas onto the team as well. And then you go into a different culture entirely. Yeah, maybe I moved a little bit too fast and maybe I took I was a little bit too hard on c- certain principles on and off the pitch. Uh, but uh, I think that it's so small margins. Uh, I'd be won one or two more games, then you would have get another season to build it. So it's so small margins. Uh, but I think that that um, I maybe went a little bit too fast with some things, and that the different differences from what they have learned or was used to, uh, or what I represent or what I came with was. Uh, maybe the gap was a little bit too big in the beginning, but they started to understand. And I think that that uh, some of the things that um, that uh, I was heavily criticized for, like letting the players sleep at home before home games, uh, how can you do that? Two years later, Guardiola came and, and then everyone said it was a brilliant idea. So it also has something to do with who says this. Yeah, I was... Uh, in, I think that you also, when you come from Norway, you need to um, maybe have success faster mm-hmm. because you come from a ski nation, Marcus. So you, they think yeah. you are a skier when you come in there, so you need to you need to um, maybe have a success uh, faster. But overall, it was a great experience, and uh, I really enjoyed that season because it was a uh, uh, you learned a lot off the pitch and on the pitch, and uh, you know Cologne is also the the media town in in Germany so it was never less than 15 reporters uh, at any training session uh, in the holidays you could have 5,000 around the, the training pitch when you were coaching and uh, so it was a great experience and it's always 50,000 on each home game no matter if you lost or won yeah it's a stadium renowned for its for its atmosphere but and it's also interesting with with Germany it's we've had some English journalists on and we've asked how the dynamics work because the German football politic dynamics are totally different. You'll have a sporting director who is a lot more vocal, a lot more in the, in the public sphere than for instance, in England, you'll have journalists who are on the insides of clubs. How is it? It's much more open. It's much more politics and it's much, and the, the power, it's also, what I experienced, a, a fight inside the club who's got the power. Mm-hmm. And, and with my year there, Wolfgang Overath, the, the world champion from 1974, he retired as a president suddenly. So it was also a president campaign behind our backs. And 
and uh, the sports director had his own ideas uh, and the scouting department had, had so there was not it was a club that fight had a lot of fights inside and and I I don't think they reacted that much to it as I did because I, for me it was clear that if it's going to be successful everyone has to go in the same direction mm -hmm. but for them I think uh, it was also a play who 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 will be the strongest here and and it was not often that we won two games in a row, but we did that uh, after six, seven we, rounds. We suddenly beat Leverkusen and Hoffenheim. And then you, you maybe now it will be calmer here. But the opposite happened because they were now afraid that this Norwegian would get a lot right. of power. So, so it, was a, it was a strange atmosphere. Yeah. Knowing what you know now, and I'm not usually a fan of asking this question because with hindsight, you you know, you can answer any questions, but knowing what you know now, how do you think you would have, have, have approached it differently? I think I would go a little bit slower on the pitch with some of them, but I think also I, I, I would have, um, I would maybe also have earlier has confronted some people in terms of, because you need to be sure that, is this the case or something? Because I think they also liked what we did. They liked that uh, we tried to build something, not for the next game, but also for the next season, etc. And that you need to have a certain culture that you, when we try to also, and maybe I should wait a little bit with that, but we tried to make a red... Um, what do you call it? Uh, red tro, uh, yeah, red line. line, like a common, yeah, silver yeah. lining. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, through the club, that everyone has the same mindset. So uh, when players come up to the our best, the best squad, they are in a way prepared a little bit. But uh, but every coach lived their own life. <laughs> everyone fought for themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Football is a cynical business. Huh? Absolutely, it is. We even on the grass grassroots level where we play. It's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, should we go into the just towards the last part so that we would like obviously you are the Norwegian national team coach so we'd have to ask a bit about how the larger football development trends in Norway and we had a mini series on 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 Norwegian football talent development that will mm -hmm. that Kieran you will get into but yeah. before that I want to I'm a bit curious about your approach going in as your first phase as, as a Norwegian national team coach because it's very unconventional untraditional in the sense that there was a pandemic. You play your first qualifier as at home in Spain against yeah. Turkey. Um, you have to answer questions about Qatar and those issues. So you're becoming more, more than a coach, becoming more of a, a spokesperson, talisman for something unrelated to football, if you call it that. Did you feel like you had to reapproach your role as national team coach from what you originally had in mind? Yeah, I think that the first half year had nothing to do with football, actually, because we had this big, big Qatar um, um, discussions all over the um, all over Norway, and we had the pandemic, and it was the only country that wasn't allowed to play in our own country, and and then we have to move everything to Spain, and that was not the easiest way for us to start and obviously a new coach with the pandemic you cannot meet the players either so i think what we did before the summertime was a summer holiday was uh, was not good it was uh, it was uh, very hectic we didn't know each other it was difficult to uh, and also then with three games uh, uh, in a very short time uh, we um, yeah we struggled to to what do you say yeah, we struggled to be a unit on and off the pitch because we had 33 players i think on the first uh, on the first uh, um, three games in spain there where we played uh, gibraltar turkey and uh, and montenegro and I, I think that was very difficult for the players because they didn't know me i didn't know them and it was difficult to uh, to read uh, uh, and obviously have all those discussions around it. So, uh, but after the summer holiday, when we come together again, it, well, the pandemic was down in the first uh, uh, part of the second year, and then we could uh, get to know each other. We could uh, train a little bit, and and I think that we did uh, a good uh, half a year there. We obviously. Um, the Turkey defeat in the first uh, game haunted us for the whole qualification and 
and, and not been able to have Eiling with us in half of the games. He, and and um, yeah, and the two of the games he played was against Gibraltar, which he probably could have done without him. <laughs> so that was a little bit difficult, but I think that we have a good feeling now. Um, and um, so um, we uh, we have no excuses now. Now we need to make sure that we qualify for the first time since 2000 in Germany 2024. That's our big aim. Yeah, well, I, I'm a bit more optimistic than I've ever been on the national team. Good. So that's uh, credit to him for that. I guess we can both share that. Scotland are now yeah. getting yeah. back. Yeah, being good yeah rub it so. in, rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Stolly, this is something that Marcus and I... Um, and spoken about a lot in terms of kind of Norwegian culture. I've, you know, I've had my fair share of experience um, living with Norwegians. I don't know if I maybe have a thing for them. Um, but from my perspective, it's always seemed that kind of Norwegian attitudes and, and personalities have always been more so on the collective. And yeah. not many Norwegians have big egos or are kind of, you know, big characters in a way. And if you tie if you try and tie that to football, I guess in the nineties when the national team had a lot of success and Rosenberg had a lot of success in Europe as well, everything was kind of predicated on the collective. But if you maybe look now, you have great individual players, and on the women's side you've Ada Hergerberg and Carolina Graham Hansen, and then on the men's side you've Haaland and Odegaard, who are kind of a little bit un Norwegian and their approach, and at least from my experience, two Norwegians who've played for Celtic, Christopher Ayer, Leo Helde, who have this sort of swag and confidence about them that I wouldn't really, you know, seems a little bit unusual for a Norwegian. I'm just wondering if you've seen that shift or that trend um, in your experience. And I think that we are a collective. You can see that with the pandemic. If the <clears throat> politicians say, jump, we jump, and that would be... Uh, Good, some some good things with it, but it can also be, certainly be some bad things about it. That you don't ask the right questions, and that you um, that, uh, that you need to also think yourself, etc. And uh, but I think that uh, what managers like about Norwegian players, uh, in a way, is that they have this collective mentality. They know that they are used to uh, to um, to play together with something, and that. Uh, that the, the, even Erdogan, who, is, uh, who has individual qualities, is a great team player. He wants to make this pressure, and I think also that is with uh, with um, with uh, some of the other players, also on on uh, the female side. Yeah. So, uh, but I think that we also need to educate those a little uh, those players who are a little bit different and and get them into our way of thinking our way of shape and and that we uh, must be better to let uh, some individual um, in a certain context be able to be individual on the pitch to so for example if you take our biggest star now Aling Orland that you you can have a good uh, total pressure pressuring uh, that you can cope with him not every time do exactly like the other uh, nine for instance that he needs that extra uh, power when he, when uh, the big chance occurs for him that so we can sprint through and, and win the game for us for instance yeah so so that's a balance because we have not a better team that everyone has to work everyone has to understand it uh, so I think it's a balance here that you can still maintain uh, the collective uh, um, thing with the team, but you also need to to um, let the biggest individuals uh, have a little bit more freedom in certain situations. Uh, and I think that in Norway we may, um, and also uh, may also uh, myself, is a little bit too quick sometimes to... Um, to make sure that everyone thinks the same, and and and, and uh, I think that we should uh, to be able to do that, and um, and um, see if we can get more match winners. And yeah, which is, seems like it's black and white. It's like the, it reminds me of the Ronaldo discussion when Ronaldo was united. It's either one or the other, rather yeah. than something in between. Um, has there been a? Is there a cultural shift in sorts? Because we had the um, we had the chief academy. 
uh, of Lillisrem, Tony Ordina son, and he, we were talking because we were interested in hearing the foreign perspective on Norwegian talent development. They said early on, you know, there's more freedom to, to play about. It's not until you became 12, 13, you start having a bit more organized, a bit more rigid. Obviously, that has had its bearings on the individual side in terms of the players we've created. Has it had a adverse effect in some ways on the players developed further back in the field? Are there certain are there certain profiles that we are missing? And and in what ways can that potentially be changed or improved? I think that uh, when uh, the Tiki Taka Barcelona uh, uh, came into the Norwegian world, and I think that uh, our success in the 90s with the national team, where we had uh, central defenders in world class, uh, suddenly everyone uh, was we missed and suddenly we lost a little bit that quality. I think that we we lack uh, um, in our uh, player development. Uh, we have understood it now, but we we have not been good enough to educate uh, defenders who can defend in a way. It's been more important for the defenders to bring the ball uh, up the pitch or from a short five meter kick or whatever, and they can't defend. So that has been uh, that has been uh, something that uh, I think we have understood now that we need also to still educate uh, players to defend uh, players who want to to um, uh, use their body to to uh, other things than bringing the ball up the pitch, so the block shots to be good headers to protect the penalty area, etc. To be good again one against one, uh, and I think that we have created so many midfielders now in Iniesta, Savi, Busquets, Moody, yeah, uh, and that we have forgot that. And also with the strikers in a way that uh, we need strikers who are on the end of crosses. We need strikers who are tough in that way. Uh, so I think that's gone a little bit missing in all those uh, silky midfielders. Uh, but um, I think we have understood it now that you need all kinds of uh, players. Well, I can't guarantee you quality, but I can guarantee you a lot of defending if you come and watch a Scottish uh, championship <laughs> game. I have, seen, I have seen some of them. <laughs> yeah, you'll see that. Uh, I, saw, uh, I saw Ross County play a lot last year with Yelda. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, right. right yeah. Uh, Fair play to him because he was 17 going at a relegation battle and now he got his Premier League debut. Yeah. So, yeah. exciting times. Um, Stola, Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us close to an hour. Really, really appreciate that. Um, it's always great to have uh, a guest like you on. And so I guess all there is to say is thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. All the best. Good luck with your careers. I will follow you. Thank you very thank much. You. Really appreciate it. All the best.